Salwete, and welcome back to Weekly Roman History. This is part 19, the Severan Dynasty. I'm your host as usual, Madeline Wainer. You can subscribe to my videos here on YouTube and follow me at Maddie Way on Instagram. This week is the bridge from one of the highest peaks of Roman history to one of its lowest points. With the end of the Nervan Antonian dynasty, we leave what is called the Classical Period. The Severan dynasty is the beginning of late antiquity. Of course, these eras are arbitrary. Rome didn't suddenly change its whole character overnight between Classical and Late Antique. Rather, Rome has been in a state of constant change for its entire history. But the five good emperors of the last video are one of the signposts historians use, the end of an era. Which, of course, means the beginning of a new era. And this one isn't as rosy for the Romans as the last one was. But before we get started, some questions for review. Here's one from way earlier. What is Domnatio Memoriae? Pause if you need to think about it. Domnatio Memoriae is the process of erasing a bad emperor's legacy, taking his name off inscriptions, repealing his laws, destroying his statues, etc. Next, under which emperor did Rome reach its largest geographical size? If you said Trajan, you remembered who has the biggest pecs. Big pecs, big empire. Next, which two of these emperors were known more for peace than for war? If you said Hadrian and Antoninus Pius, you're right. This is by Roman standards, of course. Both certainly had wars, but they didn't actively seek them the way some emperors did. Finally, what was exceptional about the way most of the five good emperors chose their successors? They adopted men they thought could do the job well, rather than exclusively looking for close family ties. But Marcus Aurelius broke this precedent, which had stood for 80 years, and chose his son Commodus as his successor. Commodus wound up destroying the stability that the five good emperors created. At the death of Commodus on New Year's Eve 192 CE, a new civil war begins. Remember 69 CE, the year of the four emperors? Well, 193 CE is the sequel no one asked for, the year of the five emperors. If you're wondering, there is indeed a year of the six emperors coming later. Each of the five would-be emperors of 193 represents the interests of one of the groups who have a history of nominating emperors. The Senate, the Praetorian Guard, and three from the army. First, the Senate takes their turn. On the night of December 31st, the conspirators sneak Commodus' body out of the palace as laundry past his own guards. They run to the house of Pertinax, a respected senator. They wake Pertinax and convince him to become emperor. He gives a large bribe to win the loyalty of the Praetorians and is officially acclaimed emperor in a meeting of the Senate on January 1st, 193. Pertinax moves swiftly to try to stamp out corruption in his new government. He also cracks down on the Praetorian Guard and his palace staff, aka the two groups that most often succeed in assassinating emperors. Pertinax tries to reform too much too fast. The coup attempts start as early as January 3rd. On March 28th, a group of 300 soldiers storm his palace, and neither the Praetorian Guard nor the palace staff try to stop them. Pertinax decides to stand his ground and try to talk sense into them, but they just kill him. Pertinax dies after ruling only 87 days. After the murder, the soldiers and Praetorians hole up in their camp. They're not sure who to nominate as the next emperor, so they announce that they are taking bids. Two rival men show up to offer larger and larger bribes to the Praetorians. It's effectively an auction for the throne, one of the most shameful events in Roman history. The winner is Didius Julianus. The Senate knows better than to try to oppose the guard. Their nominee was murdered in less than three months, so they ratify the choice. But Didius Julianus never has a hint of legitimacy. Everyone knows he bought the throne. He never gains the support of the Senate or the people. The people openly protest against him. The army has no reason to respect him, and he loses the Praetorian Guard because it's quickly apparent that, though he is rich, he isn't actually rich enough to pay what he promised them. The throne Didius bought becomes very lonely very quickly. Meanwhile, three generals in the provinces have had themselves acclaimed emperor by their troops, like Vespasian before them. In Britain, we have Clodius Albinus with four legions. In Syria, we have Pescenius Niger with three legions. And in Upper Pannonia in Eastern Europe, we have Septimius Severus, who gains some quick allies to win the support of 16 legions. Severus is the obvious heavyweight. He prepares a march on Rome. He buys Albinus' support by giving him the title of Caesar, which by now is used to give someone partial imperial powers and mark them as a successor. On June 1st, the Senate, which knows what's about to happen, passes a motion sentencing Didius Julianus to death and naming Severus emperor. 
Didius is executed in tears after only 66 days of rule. Septimius Severus is successful in maintaining power and establishing a dynasty, so that brings an end to the Year of the Five Emperors. It feels a little like cheating. Unlike the Year of the Four Emperors, which had four different emperors ratified by the Senate, 193 CE only has three official emperors. The other two, Albinus and Pescanius, were only recognized by their own troops. Even so, Severus will find it necessary to kill them before his power is secured. Severus is another step in geographical diversity for emperors. His family comes from Libya in northern Africa, and he is of mixed Italian and Phoenician heritage. Sidebar on Septimius Severus the African. The fact that Severus came from Africa leads some modern people to assert that he was black, which is not correct. As background, the terms black and white as we use them today are heavily constructed by our culture and would have made no sense to the Romans. The Romans certainly had both race and racism, but race was not identical to skin color. However, people we would describe as black existed in the Roman Empire. People of many different backgrounds and races immigrated in and out of Roman territory throughout its history and could gain power and influence in Roman society. That means there were black people spread throughout the provinces as soldiers, merchants, nobility, anything any other Roman might have been. But Septimius Severus, with his Italian and Phoenician ancestry, would not have been what we call black. The Phoenicians were a Semitic people, close to the races we might call Middle Eastern or Jewish. Severus is definitely notable for being non-Italian. He would probably had darker skin than most Romans, and ancient historians note that he spoke Latin with an African accent for his entire life, and I would love to know what that sounded like. But he wasn't black. If he lived in America today, we would likely think of him as mixed white and Middle Eastern. Severus had proclaimed himself emperor at the death of Pertinax, so he makes a big show of executing Pertinax's murderers to lend himself legitimacy. He fires the existing Praetorian Guard and replaces them with his own soldiers. Then he turns his attention to the challenge from Pescenius, the governor of Syria who had declared himself at the same time Severus had. Severus defeats Pescenius in a series of brutal battles. During one, a river is said to have run red with blood. Severus deals ruthlessly with Pescenius' followers and punishes the nearby Parthian Empire for having helped him. Severus thoroughly earns his name, which means exactly what it sounds like. Severe. Strict. Harsh. Severus is known for his cruelty. Severus then turns on Clodius Albinus, whom he declared Caesar to neutralize as a threat, but never intended to actually work with. Severus names his own son Caracalla Caesar, removing Albinus from the line of succession. War comes quickly. Severus almost loses a battle with Albinus in 197. In the heat of it, Severus is thrown from his horse, and he rips off his purple cloak to avoid being recognized. But Severus eventually wins after another bloody battle. He rides his horse over the naked corpse of Albinus. When he gets back to Rome, he purges the Senate of those he thinks disloyal, executing 29 senators. Some call him the Punic Sulla, hearkening back to the terrible days of Sulla's proscription list that killed so many prominent Romans. Since he is never popular with the Senate, Severus is careful to win support from the people through games and from the army through favors. Severus raises their pay for the first time since Domitian and allows soldiers to marry legally for the first time. As a ruler, Severus is a careful and able administrator. He spends heavily but manages to keep a surplus in the budget and is very involved with matters of law. In war, Severus is aggressive. He fights the Parthians in the Middle East to punish their support of his rival, and reconquers northern Mesopotamia for the first time since Trajan. Severus's defeats kick off the decline of the Parthian Empire, which has been an adversary of Rome's for centuries. But it's a mixed blessing. The Parthians are replaced by another Persian Empire, the Sasanians, who prove to be more united and more warlike than the Parthians. The Sasanians cause a lot of trouble for Rome down the road. Toward the end of his reign, Severus's two sons begin to embarrass him through constant public feuding. Caracalla and Geta, both in their late teens, are entitled spoiled rich kids who have had everything handed to them. And they hate each other. In 208, there's trouble in Britain, so Severus brings them both on campaign with him, hoping that experience with the army will knock some sense into them. Severus leaves Geta, the younger son, in charge of southern Britain. He and Caracalla fight in northern Britain to try to finally conquer Scotland. But Severus is too old to do much himself, and Caracalla isn't interested in the campaign as anything other than a way to win favor with the army. Severus dies in Britain in 211 at age 65. He has a mixed reputation as an emperor. He was a capable administrator, a good general, and a wise reformer, but he was also cruel and vindictive. His heirs are also absolutely incompetent, so he leaves no lasting legacy, 
everything comes crashing down within a generation. Quick review before we get to Caracalla and Geta. Which of these was the Senate's choice for successor to Commodus? The Senate's choice was Pertinax, who tried to stamp out corruption too fast and got murdered. Deus Julianus was the choice of the Praetorian Guard, and Albinus and Pescanius were Severus's two unsuccessful military rivals. Next, after Pertinax's murder, how did Didius Julianus become the Praetorian Guard's choice? The answer? He memorably won the throne in an auction for who could give the biggest bribe. He couldn't even pay what he promised, so he had no support when Severus battled his way in. Finally, which of these places did Severus not fight major wars? Severus did fight in the Middle East. He all but eliminated the Parthians, who had been rivals of Rome for centuries. And he died fighting a major campaign in Britain. He didn't have a notable war in Africa. If you remember talking about Africa earlier, that's because that's where Severus was from. Caracalla and Geta cut short Severus's war and abandoned Scotland to go back to Rome. Severus had given his sons three pieces of advice to succeed as emperors. Agree with each other, give money to the soldiers, and ignore everybody else. The second two are easy enough, but the brothers will never do the first. Severus made Caracalla and Geta co-equal joint emperors. Caracalla tries to seize sole power right away, but their mother, Julia Domna, prevents it. She protects her husband's legacy and wants her sons co-equal in power. So Caracalla and Geta bicker constantly. They compete for the backing of the Senate to get their own candidates in office, to manipulate the justice system to favor their own allies, they even back different teams in games. Things can't go on like this. As a last-ditch effort to try to coexist, they plan to divide the empire, Caracalla ruling the west and Geta ruling the east. This might have worked, or it might have escalated into a full-scale civil war. But we'll never know, because Julia Domna blocks it. She says if you divide the empire, how will you divide your own mother? But the last solution they turn to won't please her either. They start trying to murder each other. Poison at first, but they're both too careful. It's like spy versus spy. Finally, Caracalla stabs Geta in the one place where he is not closely guarded and surrounded by supporters. At their mother's house. Geta dies in their mother Julia Domna's arms. Their joint rule lasted only ten months. Thus begins the sole rule of older brother Caracalla. Incidentally, Caracalla isn't his real name. Like Caligula, Caracalla has a clothing-based nickname. A Caracalla is a long, hooded cloak popular with soldiers. Caracalla asserts that Geta had tried to murder him and that he'd acted in self-defense. He buys the Praetorian Guard's support and massacres Geta's supporters. This is like his father's purge, but much larger. People are killed at dinner tables, in the baths, in the streets, around 20,000 people in all. There are public protests, but Caracalla puts these down harshly. He also rigorously pursues Geta's Domnatio Moriae. There's a famous painting of the whole Severan family, Septimius Severus with Julia Domna and Caracalla and Geta as kids, but Geta's face has been burned out. Someone, following Caracalla's order of Domnatio, erased Geta from his childhood family portrait. In the midst of the slaughter, Caracalla finds time for a landmark bit of legislation. The Antonine Constitution of 212 declares that all freeborn males in the empire are Roman citizens. This is a massive shift in policy. If you remember, Roman citizenship was once extended only to certain families from the city of Rome itself, and the conquered cities of Italy fought a bloody war with Rome to gain citizenship. For the last 250 years, full Roman citizenship has been a privilege extended to Rome and a select group of other cities. Now it is universal. But this change really reflects a cultural shift that has already been happening for centuries. The special distinction of Roman citizenship means a lot less than it used to. The Republic is a thing of the past. Voting is mostly vestigial. Real power is gained by getting close to the Emperor, which you don't need to be a citizen to do. In making the largest grant of Roman citizenship in history, Caracalla's intent is to extend new financial responsibilities to the provinces. It does not have the impact on people's lives that it might have had a few centuries earlier. Caracalla leaves on campaign in 213. With his violence, he has made the city population extremely hostile to him, so he retreats into his father's refuge, the army. He raises soldiers' pay and wins their respect by marching with them like a common soldier and eating the same rations. Caracalla wins victories in Germany and does a tour through Eastern Europe into Asia Minor. He starts to hero worship and imitate Alexander the Great. What have I told you about ancient war boys and Alexander the Great? They all want to be him. During a visit to Alexander's tomb in Alexandria, Egypt, some civil unrest leads to Caracalla's soldiers massacring thousands of unarmed civilians. Caracalla wages another war of conquest in Parthia in 216. 
He is planning even more conquest when a conspiracy develops among his officers. They fear his erratic paranoia and want to end his long desert campaigns. Caracalla has an undignified end. He is suffering an upset stomach while marching one day and calls a halt to relieve himself by the side of the road. Only one bodyguard follows him in order to respect his privacy. The bodyguard takes Caracalla down with a single blow while Caracalla is lowering his breeches. Brutal. Next comes an interruption in the Severan dynasty. The leader of the conspiracy that killed Caracalla is Macrinus, but he pretends to be innocent and mourns Caracalla and accepts the soldier's acclamation as emperor. Like Severus, Macrinus is a military man from Africa. He's a Berber, a group we would call Middle Eastern today. Macrinus is only equestrian in rank, making him the first non-senator to become emperor. He doesn't make it long. He loses popularity with the soldiers by buying peace with the Parthians and by revoking Caracalla's pay increase. A false Antoninus pops up. Julia Misa, the sister of Caracalla's mother, Julia Domna, presents her 14-year-old grandson to the soldiers, falsely claiming that he is Caracalla's illegitimate son and heir. Caracalla was much more popular with the soldiers than Macrinus is, so they rally around this false heir and proclaim him emperor in May 218. Macrinus fights but is defeated and executed by the rebels in June. The next emperor is known as Elagabalus, which isn't his name. He's a bizarre and fascinating figure in Roman history. He's Caracalla's cousin, not his son. Elagabalus' actual father was Syrian, and Elagabalus was raised in the east. What's more, his father was the high priest of a Persian sun god named Elagabal, and the position is hereditary. The new Roman emperor is a Syrian 14-year-old high priest of an eastern cult. Elagabalus, who is known by the Romanization of his god Elagabal's name, brings his god to Rome, and I do mean physically. Elagabal is a largish black stone, roughly conical in shape and probably a meteor. Many religions at this time have cult objects that they think of as their god's literal presence on earth. So to Elagabalus, this rock is the sun god Elagabal. He reaches Rome in 219 and begins construction on a new temple on the Palatine to hold his god, which is called the Elagabalium. According to our sources, Elagabalus aims to set up a sort of monotheism, with Elagabal as the one supreme god, and all the others, such as Jupiter and Venus, as his subordinates. But we have to take all of these accounts with a grain of salt, because remember that historians distort the stories of disliked emperors. We can fairly say that Elagabalus' religion comes as a shock to the Romans who expect their emperor to head the official state religion, not import eastern deities. We can apply the same skepticism to the many reports of Elagabalus' sexual excesses. The ancient sources talk a lot about Elagabalus' bisexuality and feminine traits, which were not considered respectable in his era. Sidebar on transgender Elagabalus. Yeah, this is kind of the elephant in the room when it comes to Elagabalus. There's a famous story reported in Cassius Dio that Elagabalus referred to himself as a lady and consulted with doctors because he wanted to have surgery on his genitals, what we would call gender-confirming surgery. Modern readers are understandably fascinated by this story because it would make Elagabalus a transgender woman, a trans empress on the throne of Rome. And while it's certainly an interesting story, we have a lot of reasons to doubt it. I caution you constantly in this series not to take ancient historians at their word. They lie and distort to suit their rhetorical purposes and entertain their audiences. Cassius Dio is extremely hostile to Elagabalus and writes primarily to slander him. The story of transgender Elagabalus is not neutrally reported. It's intended to shock Dio's audience and paint Elagabalus as unnatural. Hopefully it is obvious that I do not consider trans people shocking or unnatural, but Dio did. And there's another piece of this puzzle. The Romans had a stereotype about Easterners. Eastern men tended to dress in more gaudy ways than Roman men. They wore fine silks and flashy jewelry to contrast the Romans' austere togas and plain rings. So Romans tended to regard Eastern men as feminine, like they're not real men. The story that Elagabalus wanted to be a woman is perfectly designed to fit into the stereotype of Eastern men as inferior because they're feminine. It's Roman xenophobia. Besides, plenty of historians writing before Dio bring up all sorts of scandalous rumors about Elagabalus, but don't mention this one, which supports the idea that it wasn't invented until many years later. So on balance, I don't believe that Dio's story of transgender Elagabalus is true.
It's interesting to see gender confirmation surgery pop up in an ancient history, nearly two millennia before the first one we know about. But if you're looking for representations of gender diversity in the ancient world, I think you deserve better than a story that was probably based on xenophobic stereotypes and definitely intended to slander someone. In any case, Elagabalus offends traditional Romans. He's got a different religion, he's acting in ways that seem feminine to them, and he insults the Senate by appointing men of lower standing to important positions, ignoring the traditional cursus honorum. The fact that he hangs on as emperor for four years is due to the fact that he isn't actually ruling. His grandmother, Julia Misa, and his mother, Julia Soimius, hold all the real power, and they wield it well enough to keep trouble away for a few years. But by 221, the army has begun to rebel, and Elagabalus' family believes that his behavior is jeopardizing their control over the state. So to hedge their bets, Julia Misa makes Elagabalus adopt his 13-year-old cousin, Severus Alexander, as Caesar. Alexander becomes popular with the Praetorian Guard, which is not fond of Elagabalus. They quickly become rivals, each backed by powerful women, Elagabalus by his mother, Julia Soimius, and Alexander by his grandmother, Julia Misa, and his own mother, another Julia, Julia Mamaya. Yes, they are hard to keep track of. Blame Roman sexism for guaranteeing that all the women in any given family have the same name. On March 11th, 222, Elagabalus and Alexander are in the Praetorian camp, and Elagabalus becomes furious that the guard is favoring Alexander. He orders them punished, so they turn on him. He flees into a latrine with his mother, and they are both killed there. He is 18 at his death. He falls from power just as he rose, because of the Julius. He was put on the throne by his mother and grandmother, and he only loses power when their relationship sours. Severus Alexander is 14 when he takes the throne, just like his cousin Elagabalus. His 13-year reign is considered a model of good government. Really, that means that his mother is good at being emperor, because Alexander himself never holds any meaningful control. The one thing his mother and their allies never get a good handle on is the army, which eventually proves Alexander's undoing. Julia Misa, Alexander's grandmother, dies in 224, leaving Julia Mamaya, his mother, in charge. She makes no secret of her power, styling herself as Mater Unuersi Generis Humani, or Mother of the Whole Human Race. She is careful to avoid the PR mistakes that marked Elagabalus's reign. She appoints 16 senators as advisors, respecting their prestige. She restores the old gods, sending Elagabal back to Syria, and turning the Elagabalium into the temple of Jupiter Ultor, Jupiter the Avenger. And she keeps tight control over Emperor Alexander's personal life. All goes well in Rome, but in the provinces there is constant military disobedience. Alexander's control of the military is tested in 230, when he must fight Rome's first campaign against the Sasanians, the Persian Empire which has replaced the Parthians. This campaign goes well, but as soon as it's over, he has to go fight German invasions over the Rhine in 234. In Germany, he wins no respect because he tries to buy the peace. In March 235, a group of soldiers rebel and declare a Thracian officer named Maximinus emperor. The rest of Alexander's troops defect quickly, and Alexander is murdered with his mother and their advisors. This brings the dubious extension of the Severan dynasty to an end. A final few questions for review. First, which emperor shocked Rome by importing an Eastern religion? If you said Elagabalus, you also might remember the name of his god, Elagabal, a Syrian sun god. Next, what one thing did Severus Alexander never gain control of? If you said the army, you're right. Ironic that an emperor named after Alexander the Great couldn't handle the military. Finally, which of these Julias was the mother of Severus Alexander? If you said Julia Mamaya, good job keeping track of your Julias. Julia Soimius was the mother of Alexander's rival, Elagabalus. Julia Misa was both of these emperors' grandmother, mother to the other two Julias. Julia Domna was Julia Misa's sister, the wife of Septimius Severus and the mother of Caracalla and Geta. We have just begun a tumultuous time in Roman history. Elagabalus and Severus Alexander had family connections to the Severan dynasty, but it's a bit of a stretch to call them members, since they did not inherit their positions according to the wishes of their predecessors. Indeed, the last four emperors of this video were all murdered and replaced by others. Nearly every emperor for the next century will be murdered and replaced with a battlefield appointment. We are entering Rome's most chaotic era since the fall of the Republic. In the next video, the crisis of the third century. Thank you.